Hello, Irish fans. It is Sunday night, and that means it's time for the Mike Goolsby Show. Following Notre Dame's 34-6 win over uh, the Naval Academy, Notre Dame improves to 8-1. Mike, uh, you and I were talking before going on air here how interesting it was to see uh, several Notre Dame defensive players at, at like different positions uh, for the game, particularly starting with Jack Kaiser, who started at safety. What do you think that ultimately meant in terms of how they were going to defend Navy? Um, it was pretty apparent. I think Coach Freeman made the decision to uh, swap he and uh, Houston Griffith mm -hmm. out in terms of uh, just ability. Like we've, yeah, you know, Houston's been starting all year, and like Greg, you never hear his name called, like yeah, ever. Um, it's like sometimes it feels like you're playing with ten guys in the field. So I think that um. Coach Freeman probably thought that Kaiser was just better served to be a more dynamic tackler, more decisive in terms of his reads and coming downhill. Um, we'll get into like some of the backup safeties, hopefully. Um, you know, Xavier Watts showed really, really, really well yeah. um, at the end of the game, as did a lot of young players. But, you know, going into the game, you know, I watched your and Tim's show last night. You guys did a, a bang out job. You guys are doing a good job. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and I, like one of the first things, like your takeaway, Greg, from the game was that was a boring game, in particular the first half. So, yeah. you, when you do these shows and you're trying to provide some content for folks, it's like, gosh, you have to go through with a fine tooth comb sometimes to try and find some some talking points. And one of those talking points was going to be the the usage of of Coach Freeman's personnel. Like yeah. um, they, they primarily played out of. They played in like a 4-4, and they played out of like a 5-2 slash 3-4, depending on how you want to slice it. So, and yeah, there was a lot of moving parts and a lot of a lot of toys for him to play with. Uh, I know you, you beat in Omaha. You have uh, a heightened familiarity with Xavier Watts, and I agree with you. The, the game uh, seemed boring. We both rewatched it today, and it was still boring until the second half, and you mm -hmm. saw some of these new guys come in. And I think one of the guys – that, that really I'm so excited to see maybe get more playing time down the road is Xavier Watts. What do you think about him? Yeah, so I got a chance to see him on two separate occasions in like a seven-on-seven seven type environment Yeah. Um, before he took off for South Bend. And, you know, my scouting report on him was that he wasn't a burner in terms of just flat-out speed, but he was a really good football player. Uh, great body control and really good hands, ran good routes. Um, so he, he may have found a home, put it that way, on the defensive side of the ball. He seems too small-ish to me to play the rover position. Yeah, um, I'm sure that time that he spent there just gave him a better understanding of the, the defense as a whole. But, uh, yeah, I think it was his first tackle, like, he came downhill, made a great tackle, and just, like, looked the part. And he's a really quiet kid, from what I understand. I met his father once, actually, too. Um, but he's a really quiet kid, and I think he takes football really seriously, Greg. Mm. And uh, there's another play, you know, maybe his fourth or fifth snap of the game. They were in, like, a, they had twins outside the slot receiver cracked back and Xavier ran into it like full speed. And yeah, as, as any coach, we've all, we've all heard this, but like, as any coach would say, like, if you're going to make a mistake, make it aggressively. And not that he made a mistake, but he was like, Hey, if I screw up, I'm going to screw up going hundred miles an hour. And sometimes that's what playing defense is about. So yeah. Um, it'll be interesting. And I mean, we could talk about, the Houston Griffin like scenario and that, you know, he kind of left school and they kind of came back mm -hmm. and that's, that's, we'll call it drama, Greg, but like to kind of create that like preseason type drama and to not show up and to not show out thus far in the season kind of makes him look like an ass. And then when a, a kid that comes in and hasn't even played the positions <laughs> full time um, this season comes in and looks better, it's just not a good look for Houston. Yeah. Thus far. And, and and we talked about, I mean, what tape would he have shown other colleges of, of, of like highlights or exceptional play he had at Notre Dame? And I agree with you. Like, he just isn't a guy who you see flash a lot during the course of games. And so. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm talking about Greg. I'm glad he's back because they need the bodies at that position. But like, you know, 
Well, maybe you go back to, I, I don't know all the particulars of the transfer portal, but maybe a, a, a you know, a prospect, not the, like look, we're jumping to saying he's going to transfer or something, but, you know, maybe you go off of his high school rankings, but, um, you know, I, I, I was forced to play inside linebacker, but like the dream position for most defensive players is a safety position. I mean, yeah. you get to do it all, run support, play coverage, blitz. Um, and yeah, you just haven't heard his name called. So that's why we saw the switch with Kaiser playing uh, center field. You know, when they played that 4-4 front, Jack was playing center field. And then when they went to that kind of 5-2 slash 3-4 look, they had, uh, I think they had prior, what I have in my notes. Yeah, they had, uh, yeah, they had Houston and Kaiser playing like deep halves right. in that 5-2. So I, I thought it was interesting in terms of like the interchangeability and Coach Freeman and those toys again that he had to play with. I thought they maybe could have moved, you know, Jack to like an outside linebacker and put Isaiah Pryor as that free safety. Um, and Isaiah Pryor, just real quick, and I thought that uh, I, I really feel like that he's definitely been an unsung hero. Yeah, I mean, he's like a Swiss Army knife, and hopefully he's going to play himself onto an NFL roster just because of his. Uh, multiplicity can do a lot of different things for an NFL team. I mean, he's a big kid. And then he had that fourth down cover uh, in the fourth quarter as well. Um, that, that was a nice play. They seem to be pretty interchangeable. Like you saw uh, Pryor and Kaiser it, it, either in coverage or up near the line of scrimmage during the course of the game. And when you played now, you played against Navy, what, three times? I know you were out for a year. Uh, well, yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, so well, back then, Greg, how much do you uh, guys the, rotate people? Because the snap count thing is going to be amazing tomorrow because I think Notre Dame, I mean, they played, I want to say, 11 defensive linemen. I'm, I might be wrong on that. But did you guys rotate that much uh, when you were playing Navy? No. So a couple things. One, it's nice to have a, a, a fellow alum <laughs> uh, co-hosting, classing it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> Singer. I, love, I love Singer, but yeah. no, I'm kidding. Mike. I love you. So – but yeah, back then, we hardly ever rotated. I mean, you yeah. would rotate your defensive line uh, a little bit, mm -hmm. but we played a lot. And, you know, Derek Curry, uh, who I love, you know, he mm -hmm. was a co-captain and he was my, you know, he got me lined up a lot of times I, um, <laughs> in terms of playing out there. But, you know, we talked, you know, years later. And he just he, – he, he alluded to that. He was like, man, we played so many snaps on defense. He's like, we could have had better stats or had more highlight tapes and um, just had a stronger showing our senior year. If A, if the offense would have been better. But, yeah, I mean, there was a play – I think we played SC, USC, Greg, one year. Maybe it was my junior year, and, like, defense had 97 snaps. And, like, you went back – like, Courtney Watson was a – he never came off the field. He literally played 97 snaps at inside linebacker. That's nuts. In, in 2002. So, yes. So, to answer your other question, Greg, we played – so, I played against Navy twice. But then I also played against Air Force a handful of times, too. That's right. Um, so back then. So, super familiar with all things option. <laughs> Mike Singer just said in the chat uh, that he loves. Well, he said that he loves me, but he loves both of us. Um, he, he's de he's definitely tuning in. We have a, a, a couple questions about Logan Diggs. I mean, I think that's also one of the big takeaways, especially out of the fourth quarter when the game was getting exciting. What'd you think about his performance? I think that he looks more confident than Tyree does, mm -hmm. just in terms of like overall demeanor. And sometimes you can fake it till you make it. Um, but he looks like he belongs there and like, he's kind of owning that role. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, just to look at him, like his physicality, like his build and things like he almost looks, I don't know if there is a prototypical running back. I mean, you've got the Derrick Henry's of the world and you've got, you know, much smaller players, but uh, yeah, he's got that like prototypical kind of size and yeah. overall look to him. And you can tell that both, he and Kyron have kind of switched up like the overall running style. Like we alluded to that last week on the podcast, you're still not getting a ton of movement from our, from our offensive line. So these guys have sort of switched up their style and been a little bit patient and then popped out where it could be. So um, I'm really optimistic about, 
his future and and I wasn't uh, I wasn't as big of a Kyron fan last year as I've become this year. And, um, but yeah, I think into the future to have a Logan Diggs and have a Chris Tyree back there, it's pretty dynamic. Yeah, Logan Diggs. I mean, you know this because I know you train athletes. Uh, when when people think about players that are physically ready for the college level, it's not about how big your biceps are. It's particularly in the lower body. And Logan yeah. Diggs looks like he's been on the squat rack for ten years. I mean, he's sure he, he's a he's a pretty built dude. Yeah, um, and I, I think when when talking about just to touch on this real quick too, like when training like youth athletes, especially at the high school level, you know they're young men. They've got all that testosterone, and uh, they want to get big. Mm -hmm. And it's important to to draw a line between there's uh, there's a definitely a difference between being big for the sake of being big and being strong. Right. Right. There has to be a balance. You want to be as strong as possible, but don't. So if, if whatever he is, 210, he looks like he's probably 210. If I had to guess, you know, 205, 210. Great size for running back. And yeah, definitely looks the part for sure. Uh, make sure to hit like on this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, please sign up for our newsletter on blueandgold.com. You can get that on the front page of our website. Uh, it's also it's also in the description of any video we have on YouTube, as well as uh, embedded in, in most of our content as well. Uh, Mike, let's talk about uh, Jack Cohn. Um, you know, I I, I, I I understand Todd Suarez's point here. I mean, it seems every game we come out of, there's, there's a contingent of Notre Dame fans who either – want to see exclusively Tyler Buckner. They want to think about the future and play more of Tyler Buckner. But you can't argue with Jack Cohn's numbers. Uh, I, I do see where you want him to do things better, but at the end of the day, they're 8-1, and one, and he's putting up the numbers you see here. Yeah, but why is it – yeah, I know this is my show, Greg, but why is it that, like, like you read comments and you just get the overall sense from people – following a Notre Dame game. I just don't think that Jack Cohn, like, in, he just doesn't, he's, there's not much exciting about him. He's just very sort of bland. And I yeah. think that people tend to look at upside and look at, there's always the argument of potential versus production, right? So like Jack Cohn's given you a little bit of, or a fair bit of production, but the, you don't see as much potential as you do with, with Buckner. Um, he has seemed like he's figured out the deep ball, uh, at least this game. And, and Kevin Austin had a whale of a game. I think that Jack Cohn's biggest area of improvement at this point is uh, the pocket presence. It's very strange how he always tends to move up. And um, the only other takeaway, too, Greg, was like, and I think they even mentioned this on the actual – television broadcast he has happy feet still so he has yeah. time even though we did take a couple sacks or a few sacks against navy which is too bad but he's getting rid of the ball sooner than he has to even when he has time um he did miss some throws uh, but yeah and then this was another one of those games greg where we needed a quote-unquote spark right right so i think tyler went in on the fourth or fifth offensive series and marched down the field, converted two third downs. Two of them, I think he did with his legs, and one he did through the air. So I don't have a problem with the way, like, the usage. Um, like, this game was a perfect scenario. It was like, let's give Tyler a whole series, which Mike Singer and I talked about last week. Give him a whole series. Let him continue to get his feet wet. And really, he's just got to get over that kind of play anxiety um, that you see or that you've seen through him kind of sailing some balls at this point. So. Mm. I'm glad that we have Jack Cohn for sure. Yeah, but uh, the future is elsewhere. Well, what do you think uh, about Tyler Buckner in that first half drive? He comes in, uh, was exceptional on third down, and, and leads Notre Dame to a touchdown, their first one of the game. Yeah, so you can see on his on his touchdown throw, he's got a whip for an arm, man. Like mm -hmm. it just it pops out of his arm, and uh, <laughs> I've talked about like the way Kaiser throws the ball and that he kind of. To me, he sort of pushes it. I, it it's it's uh, Greg, do you have any kids? Do you have children? I have two, yes. <laughs> you so how, old, how old are they? Uh, are they're they? nine and seven. So like when they were a little bit younger, like I'm, I'm, I presume you played catch with them. Sure. Like in the, like where you sort of sort of kind of guide the ball to them. When I watch Jack Cohn, or Jack, uh, Jack Cohn, excuse me, throw a ball, it looks like he's trying to play catch with a little kid. Yeah. It's almost like he's just trying to, just do it just so 
So uh, I don't even know what the question was, but um, I'm just talking Tyler yeah, Buckner yeah, in, in that drive. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Buck, Buckner looked great, and again, he he picked up two third downs. Yeah, um, and uh, we we already know he helps it helps in the run game, and I just think that my whole thought process of being pro Buckner in terms of developing him and bringing him along, Greg, was like in those big time games against an Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson, you name it, right? Yeah. Um, you want a dynamic athlete at that position. You need a dynamic athlete at that position to sometimes make some magic. Whereas Cone doesn't have a lot of magic. It's like if, if everything's blocked well and people get open, he'll deliver the ball. But when you play against these elite level teams, um, it's not always going to be clean. And I, I think Tyler can give us a little bit of that magic to get us over the hump in those big time games playing against those NFL type athletes. Uh, we'll get to Thomas's question right now. How do you feel about our next game against Virginia? We still don't know. I think the status of, of Armstrong, their quarterback, and we know they've relied on him a lot to throw the ball around the field 50 times a game. Yeah. I, there's been a couple games. I thought we might lose to UNC, Greg, and somehow we always end up pulling it out. So it's yeah. like, how do I feel about it without doing any, any homework on Virginia at this point? I feel like it'll be kind of an ugly game and we're going to end up winning it ugly. It's just, yeah. um, I think it's good for us to go on the road. Hopefully it's a night game type atmosphere, but you know, we all agree. We came out a little flat. It's a day game at Notre Dame stadium against Navy. Um, so I think it's always good for us to go on the road. I think we have a little bit more juice going on the road. So um, just keep winning. That's all you can say. Let me ask you a question going back to Jack Cohn, that the touchdown pass he had to Kevin Austin, the 70 yarder. Um, sure. What were your thoughts on that play? Was that him scouting the safety for Navy, not being all that good, or did he miss a back shoulder throw here? What do you think? You know what oh, I mean? I like, think... because yeah. if it's, in, it, well, it, he threw it inside. If that's an elite safety, that's a pick. So give me a couple minutes to talk this through. Mm -hmm. So go for it. They were playing like a sort of a cloud coverage, a cover two. So you can teach cover two corners to play it technique wise, play it one way. You want to route, reroute somebody into the safety. So which gives the safety less ground to cover, if that makes sense. Yeah. Or they want to reroute the receiver to the outside to make it a harder throw where the quarterback has less uh, real estate between the sideline, if that makes sense. Yep. So it was nice to see Austin like sort of get off a little bit of like press coverage where he used his hands, kind of had a nice little swim move. Uh, I thought the corner kind of played it lazily, uh, which gave Kevin a, a free release. I don't think it was supposed to be a back shoulder fade. I don't, I, and I don't think that Jack kind of scouted the safety. I think the safety was a step slow. I mean, it's not, um, you know, a safety from LSU or something playing, right, Greg? So maybe a little bit lesser athlete at that position that was trying to make a play um, and probably took a little bit of a bad angle, but that was a close call. I mean, if that, if that safety was a half a step quicker, that would have been an interception. So yeah. it looks great on paper. And then again, it's going back to Jack's stats. So we had a 38 yard pass to Kevin Austin, which was a beautiful catch uh earlier in the game and then you had that 70 yard touchdown so do the math you take off if jack threw for what 270 uh yeah i'm sorry i put myself on mute because my dryer my washer dryer is going nuts right above me but uh he was 23 of 29 for it was under 300 yards more than 250 yards let me let me let me bring that up yeah i think it was 269 off the top of my head but yeah that's part of podcasting greg you got dryers you got kids you got dogs barking it's what, it's what we do. But regardless. Uh, uh, I got it right here. Yeah, yeah 269. 269. Yeah. So you say, okay, well, Jack had a great game. So 269 minus 111, um, you know, you can kind of do the math. I can't. I'm no good with numbers. But uh, that was that was two chunk plays that we love to see. But it, it, I guess it maybe makes Jack's performance on paper a little bit less spectacular. But it's really, 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 really nice to see Kevin Austin start making some plays and putting some of that God-given ability to work. Uh, I was ecstatic for him because he is a, 
he, I don't think he's like as, as fluid of an athlete as like a Chase Claypool was. He's a little bit more linear. He kind of reminds me more of Miles Boykin um, in terms of his the way that he plays the game. But great play. If 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 Tyler Buckner had thrown that ball, Greg, it might have got there a split second earlier. It might not have been a, as close of a call in my estimation. You there, Greg? Sorry there. Uh, my washer and dryer just stopped. I'm sorry. It was nuts. Well, I can't um, hear it on our, yeah, we can't hear it on our end. On okay, end good, anyway. good, good, good. Um, I want to ask you about Kurt Heinisch. Uh, Ten tackles on the night or on the day. Um, you know, he's, he's just – I'm so happy for the guy. He got the game ball. Um He's played in more games than any other player in Notre Dame history. I want to ask you who who was that kind of guy on your team back at Notre Dame the 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 player that that was just kind of the old man of the group for lack of a better term. Oh, that's a great yeah, that's a great question, Greg. And um, yeah, I echo your sentiments in regards to Kurt for sure. And he's played against this this offensive system so many times. It's like. Uh, you'd almost be like a GA almost on the field or another coach on the field. But our version of that, I would have to say it would have been Kyle Budensack. Yeah. Who was probably the least heralded recruit in my recruiting class. You know, a three-star type kid. Um, ended up being the second kid in our class to actually play. Matt Levesque, you have played as a true freshman as a quarterback. But Kyle was a strong side defensive end starter for like three years three and a half years you know would end it would end a year having like 28 tackles and maybe a couple sacks but like his job was to keep tight ends and keep offensive tackles off of us linebackers and he was just you know did it well and took his job super seriously and mm -hmm. ironically that you bring him up when we played we played navy my senior year we played him in an NFL stadium. It might have been the Ravens. I don't remember where we played him. Again, I have no memory. But uh, like we're like halfway through the first quarter, and Kyle's screaming at me because I'm, I'm, I'm making the wrong reads where I'm supposed to get the fullback, and he's going to take the quarterback or vice versa. And he's like screaming at me because uh, yeah, he took his job really seriously. He did really, really wasn't again, uh, you know, was never really going to get his name in the paper per se, but just consistent and i had a coach tell me a long time ago greg that consistency is the truest measure of performance and you know kurt has been a uh very consistent albeit unheralded player and i would say Budensack was the same way i'll have to text him let him know i gave him a shout out here I can't hear you, Greg. I'm sorry, dude. Oh, there you go. I keep messing. Now I hear up. you. I, I keep. I, I have had. I'm. So, I'm sorry, everyone. I've had to keep putting myself on mute because of noise here. Um, Jamie, Jamie McNeil asked, "Does Austin need to return next year to polish up his game and do better in the NFL draft?" Kevin Absolutely. Yeah. No question. No question. Yeah. And again, you're looking for consistency. So he's shown flashes of being great, but um, yeah, I, I would think. Uh, another year and hell we need him back based off our <laughs> receiver numbers. So I think that, I think that I don't even think it'll be a question in his mind. If it is a question in his mind, I think that coach Kelly and staff can make a really um, honest appeal to him and say, listen, dude, you're going to be the guy, right? Right. Based right. off the youth behind him. And uh, the receiver group, that's another topic. That's, that's a worry here going the last three weeks of the, of the season is, is with Avery Davis. And we don't know the extent of his injury, but uh, they're down to five scholarship wide receivers. One of which has not played yet. Um, Jaden Thomas. And, 
you know, Kevin Austin is, is, I mean, he's going to have to step up big time. They can't afford another injury there. Uh, they might have to go to like a Chris Salerno who's a walk on, um, you know, who knows? Uh, but yes, well, I would say, I would say like, and this is me trying to peel, peel things back a little bit. So with a player like Kevin Austin, where the ability is fairly obvious Mm -hmm. to, to all of us, like, man, the kid's got the size, the length looks the part long strider, borderline suspect hands at times, but I think confidence might be a bit of an issue or was a bit of an issue with Kevin Austin. So keeping with that, Greg, like when you're thrust into being the guy and really there's based off the depth chart, there's zero chance I'm coming out of the game. Even if I drop two balls, sometimes with a guy that's struggling with confidence, that's what they need is like, okay, I'm not going to get sat down. I'm not going to get screamed at. Like I have to go produce. Uh, so I would think that you would start to see Kevin Austin's kind of star continue to rise based off of that. So you can put all the nerves. I'm not getting rotated out. Like I'm the guy now, um, and watch and see what happens. I'm excited for him. Yeah. They're going to get a lot of opportunity. I think starting next week, uh, to catch the ball, Virginia has been giving up a ton of yardage, um, and a ton of points particularly through mm-hmm. the air. I think a lot of people saw that game against North Carolina a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then, I mean, excuse me, against BYU a couple of weeks ago. And it was a, they, 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 there was like no defense. I mean, it was just like passing the ball all around the line. That happens, right? And then you'll see guys like, uh, that, that always amazes me. Like Oklahoma doesn't play defense traditionally. And then they'll always have like a linebacker go in the first two rounds. They yeah. always have like a defensive end. It's like, how do you draft it? Like, if, if you had NFL talent on your defense, how are you giving up 40 a game? It's so strange to me. Yeah, it's uh, – uh, you one an, another thing, kind of a side topic you and I talked about. I just – I laughed at this question. I think you were maybe asking kind of tongue-in-cheek, but you're like, what is Brian Pulling's obsession with playing walk-ons as, as punt returners? Because we just brought up the fact that Chris Lerno might be pressed into action at wide receiver as a walk-on. Yeah. I don't get it, personally. Um, <laughs> now, granted – now, I also don't get having your best player on offense and Kyron back there either, mm-hmm. right? I don't get I don't get it. So I know there's a trust factor and all that. Um, but, to, yeah, we've always had whoever it was last year. I forget the name. But, you know, we had a – and I don't know if our punt returner last year ever returned a punt. Like, it was fair catch all the time. And this goes back to, like – I'm picturing a big time game. We're playing, well, it's hypothetically, Greg, we're playing Alabama in the final four, right? And it's like, you need to manufacture excitement. You need to manufacture points. You need to manufacture field position. Like you got to go, you have to empty out the drawer and be like, okay, what do we have to work with? Uh, And it's just, to me, it's just a missed opportunity to put a dynamic or a more dynamic athlete back there. I mean, it makes you feel good and all that, but put them on kickoff team versus having to be your, your, your kick returner. I just feel like it's a weight. I really do. Right. Also, hang on. (laughs) Like Isaiah Foskey's on kickoff team. Like we have all of these starters that are playing special teams and believe me, I get it. Yeah. I don't know if like your potential first round defensive end running down on kickoff team. Like, you know, like, do we not have enough bodies? Like you've, you've made the point. I know it's a leadership thing and all that, but the risk reward there is, it doesn't compute in, in my brain. Do you feel though it, it, that college football is trended that way though? I mean, it feels like more so than maybe 20 years ago, starters play more on coverage units. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe, but again, who is it? Who had that expression? Was it Jimmy Johnson is like, you know, I'm going to treat you all fair, but I'm not going to treat you all the same. So like an Isaiah Foskey, to me, categorically, is it is different than Drew White? They're both, yeah. you know, starters. Yeah, uh, that's where I'm at. Todd Suarez, uh, he asks if if the Navy game was played in the first week of October and the Cincy game yesterday, are we nine and zero? Oh? Good question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Um, yeah, I would agree. It's just in in a. I hate to say this. But like, yeah, maybe a lot of fans would tend to agree with this or could relate. Part of me is kind of happy that we have one loss. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, could you imagine? You all like, don't want to get blown out in the playoff argument? Well, yeah. And I think, uh, in, you know, Mike Singer, he said last week, he's like, I love conspiracy theory Goolsby, right? <laughs> so, like, so, you know, you get to see the coaches' votes, votes, right, Greg, when it comes to, like, yeah. So I, I, I always feel like that, like, uh, Dabo Sweeney and Nick Saban always give Notre Dame votes, like, to get in. Uh, and I would think that they do that because they want to play us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. it's it's an easier it's an easier round one opponent. So, in yeah, this this year we don't I don't think we want to be in the playoffs because I, I do think we probably get dusted by a Georgia. I mean, we're playing a you know third four string tackles and uh, what they've yeah. done is remarkable. Yeah. yeah. What, we, what we've done this season is remarkable. To, and it goes back to that culture, figuring out how to win games. But I'm not upset that we have the one loss for that exact reason. Can you imagine the the narratives going on, though, if Notre Dame were 9-0, you'd be, you'd be answering for the rest of the college football world saying, oh, no, here we go again. You know, they're going to make the playoff. You're going to get crushed. You know, here's the list of teams with at least one loss that should get in before Notre mm-hmm. Dame because we yeah. know what's going to happen to Notre Dame. Yeah, that's the way it goes. And that's why, you know this as an alum, like people either love Notre Dame or they hate them. And scenarios yeah. like that, which you just which you just mentioned, uh, you're going to create more people that hate Notre Dame. <laughs> right, right, exactly. I mean, you can't blame Notre Dame. They went undefeated those two years. You know, I mean, uh, the two recent years where they made the playoff. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Yeah. Thing- so, but that, well, one last thought on that, Greg. Like, it goes back to, and I, you know, and I have to be critical, right? Because that's kind of what I'm paid to do here, in trying to, you know, find interesting sort of viewpoints on things. But like, you need a dynamic quarterback slash athlete, big timer at that position. And yep. then the only other thing that I was thinking about, and like I love what Freeman's doing on the recruiting trail. Like we need secondary guys. Um, specifically, I saw a picture of Kyle Hamilton, like basically dapping up Sonny Styles before Sonny the Styles, game. Yeah, uh, I thought Kyle Hamilton was big. Like Sonny Styles looks like a defensive end standing next to him. He's a big dude. Crazy. He was last going. spring when we had him at the Rivals camp in Indianapolis. I mean, he's a thick kid that can run. He Singer brought yeah. up last week. He's like that. Uh, he's like Isaiah Simmons that went to Clemson a few years ago. Is now in the like league. It. He's he, he's built the exact same way. He's just he's there's no lie on his height. He's literally like six four. He's thick already, and he can run like like a deer. So we're getting these players in, but we now we need to get them. We need to get like high level, talented guys, competitive guys, long athletes out at the corner position. And then as much as I love our defensive front, which has been a strength of the defense throughout the entirety of the year, we're small up front. And again, yeah. I'm talking playing the Bamas and playing the the Georgias and the Ohio States of the world. Like our our defensive line looked to be the same size as as Navy's offensive line, which is a yeah. little worrisome. So it's just another takeaway, just something to hopefully uh, that's a, that's on our, our our recruiting wish list is a bit more size from our our, our down linemen and on defense. Yeah, because Howard Cross isn't isn't big. Uh, I wouldn't say either the Adi Milolas are. Um, no, but they sure they sure played a lot yesterday and, and did the job. But yeah, I get your point. I mean, there isn't the Stefan Tuit. Um, Jerry Tillery type on the roster right now. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, the guys. That, yeah, we, we we have a couple guys that we've recruited, like Jason Anye. Like he could be one of those guys if you develop them. But I'm yeah. saying guys that physically, with their stature, you know, the first guy off the bus uh, type scenario. Greg, that's we we need a few more of those guys because that's where that's where I'm always, I'm always looking at. Like if this is going to be a national championship program, you know, what's missing, right? Um, and uh yeah these two yeah. here riley mills is, is the kind of like get off the bus guy uh but I he's agree. still not getting a ton of reps and then then ada keenan aina is uh a bigger oh he's a big there. boy yeah he yeah. really jumped yeah he got some 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 kind of garbage time there at the end yeah that's uh that looks like an sec interior lineman or 92 does right I, yep what did um 
just going back to Jack, we've, we've had a couple questions uh, come through since then. So I'm just going to pop this one up there. Uh, give Buckner or Pine more reps. I understand Cone is a good QB, and I appreciate what he has done for ND so far, but I think we've seen enough of him. Uh, I don't know if it's a tired topic yet, Mike, but it's certainly one that's lasted uh, throughout the year. Uh, well, I, I do get the argument. Like, I do want Tyler Buckner to play more. It seems like they missed – I mean, there was – Let's go to the drive sheet because there's actually they had more drives than you can than you can kind of ask for yesterday against Navy, but still yeah, ten drives, right? Yeah, there's still not a lot of time to play two quarterbacks uh, with just ten drives. So what's interesting, we're like in this in this in this game in particular, we were fortunate enough to be able to roll our threes in on defense. Like a, a guy like Prince Kali got to play again. Uh, aforementioned Xavier Watts got to play. Um, so, like, you would think that given this scenario, why couldn't we give Tyler one or two more series? You understand? Mm-hmm. So that was uh, – It's you mentioned is it a tired topic. It's not a tired topic. I mean, Notre Dame and the coaching staff, we did this to ourselves, right? Yeah. I think the big argument, like, if you had Pine out there versus Cone – it might not be that much that much chatter about it. It's just Cone is – I don't know if it's his demeanor. Um, I can get into – and I have gotten into, like, his arm strength, you know, the accuracy and things. I mean, I went back and rewound that that uh, that first deep ball that he threw out to, to Austin, and I think it was like a 38-yard 38 38-yard 38 throw. And to me, that's about the max that you're going to get out of – Jack's ability to accurately throw the ball downfield. Yeah. So that being said, it still was nice to see and nice to get that connection. But that's why I, I don't know. I just I just feel like you'd have to do a survey of of Notre Dame fans across the across the board. But what is it that irks people about, about Jack Cohen? Is it again his demeanor, his approach to the game? He's just kind of very stoic. Uh, I, I really don't know what it is, but um, I just think he's uninspiring is really, is really what, like, we know what we have and everybody wants to play with that shiny new toy and we're, we keep getting it taken away from us in, in, in Tyler. <laughs> yeah, I think we both agree that we're glad Notre Dame has him. I mean, uh, I don't know if they're eight and one. And to D-Rock Irish's point, what can you complain about? I just think Notre Dame fans now are acutely aware of what you t- you mentioned earlier, like, for Notre Dame to compete with Alabama or Georgia, their quarterback has to be awesome. You look at who Alabama's lost to over the past few years. I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, Johnny Manziel, uh, yeah. Trevor Lawrence. Um, I think when they lost to Ole Miss maybe four or five years ago, it might have been Jevin Sneed. So not you know, sure. not a Heisman winner, but but you know what I mean? Like like for Notre Dame to do that sort of thing where you beat an Alabama you need a, a crazy good quarterback. And I think Notre Dame fans, like I said, are aware of that now. And, and Jack Cohn is not that, although I think he's, he's done very admirably so far this year. Yeah. He's a, he's more of a throwback type player. Um, and then like, like I said, but there's still, there's still for as much experience as he has, like the happy feet that we saw this last game and that like, bro, you have four seconds, five seconds to throw the ball. Some of these times, Mm-hmm. And then, like, he's like, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, he just gets rid of it. Or he scurries up in the pocket and sacks himself. Uh, stuff like that's just – you're not getting the upside of Buckner, and then you're still getting these stupid kind of, like, mistakes. Um, anytime he leaves the pocket, like, he drifts away, and then, like, you know he's just going to throw the ball away. Whereas, like, if that was a rep with Tyler, he might be able to make something happen. And people yeah. see that. You know, made my father um, – texted me during the game he's like this is a shit show he's like pick a quarterback already you know it's like even he's upset and he's a huge Notre Dame fan even he's upset like you know figure this out guys so and the Uh, the sad part is is that pine pine that's the saddest part I mean we're gonna get we're gonna get to see enough Tyler Buckner uh or see more of Tyler into the future and and Drew Pine's really the it's kind of sad, right? Because when he when he was called upon, he did really really well, and then he just put him back on the shelf. So mm-hmm. that's the uh, the bummer in the in the scenario to me. Uh, true comment here uh, from PJ Mac five five zero three five five. It was like Alabama's loss came to a Heisman Trophy. Camp. That's correct, but I, I think just overall, I mean, 
particularly when Notre Dame has played those teams in the playoffs, you, they, they go into those games down 21 because of the difference at the quarterback position. You know, they've brought, I mean, I love Dean Book, but they brought him against Trevor Lawrence. Uh, and they brought him, you know, I guess Mac Jones. I mean, he was in the being a first round draft pick, but, um, you well, know, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, PJ Mac, you know, forgive us for having an opinion, but like, uh, outliers don't prove your argument and just in general. Yeah. So yeah, that'd be a bit of an outlier, but you know, we're talking about big time scenarios, big time matchups, uh, those high energy sec games, you're playing against NFL type athletes on the, on the opposition and you, you need a bit of magic. And I think Tyler's got a, a lot of it. I know you're a defense guy, but uh, the offensive line has probably been the second most talked about comp or topic for Notre Dame this year. Just what are your thoughts on, on how Joe Alt has been doing and, and the future and the development with Blake Fisher, who looks like he's walking around pretty well on the sidelines, right? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back to my buddy, Kyle Budensack that I just mentioned. So like Kyle, Probably as a, you know, whatever he is, 39, 40 years old now, probably walks around at 220, 225, 230. Like that's his normal walk around weight, whereas he had to get up to like 270 to play a strong side defensive end. And this poor kid, Greg, would eat constantly. He'd be stuffed and he'd be like laying on the floor eating pretzels, just trying to get as much food into his system so he could maintain that weight. Yeah. So what Joe Alt has done over the last 12, you know, 14, 16 months to go from being like a 240 pound ish tight end to being a you know close to 300 pounder and to maintain that weight while being a full-time starter as a true freshman with the course load and all of that stuff is beyond remarkable it truly is um and i said kind of tongue-in-cheek earlier in the season like when the offensive line started to turn around greg like maybe joe alt is your mid-season mvp like legitimately uh blake fisher he might be better suited as a right tackle just because I don't think that he has the athleticism and the, the feet that Alt does. Mm. So it's not a knock at all on Blake Fisher, but Blake Fisher is a massive human being. Um, and I remember like, you know, in my time in the NFL, the two cups of coffee that I had there, like we had, when I was in Dallas, they had a guy named uh, Flozell Adams. They used to call him Flozell the hotel because he was so big. Yeah. Like, you'd stand next to him. He's such a big human being that, like, how the hell is anybody supposed to be able to get around him? He's just so big, you know? Yeah. And that's all that you have in, in Blake Fisher is just the sheer size. So either way, um, between those two, it looks like you've got your next crop of kind of marquee, um, you know, Notre Dame offensive linemen. Well, I think that should about do it, Mike, right? We're 42 minutes in. I apologize earlier, everyone, for the uh, for the issues with the mute thing. I, I would have sworn you guys could have heard the uh, I had I had the washer and dryer going upstairs, and it was loud in here. So I, I put myself on mute and and forgot to unclick myself on mute. But no, um, it's all good, man. That's all. It's all part, part. That's part of podcasting. I'm just looking through my notes. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I don't think we missed anything. Uh, no, uh, we got through. You sent me nine points. I think we got through all of them. Well, great job, Greg. <laughs> Thanks, man. I, I apologize for that. Uh, Mike Singer always warns me. He says, "Don't, don't ever hit the mute button. Just let what, if, even if you knock something over, just let it be." And I, I did. I, I hit the mute button because I, you know, you got to remind yourself then to go back and hit it. And we're, it's all good. We're clicking a bunch of other buttons. So, uh, thank, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the like uh, button for this video. That helps us a whole lot uh, with getting these videos out to as many Notre Dame fans as possible. Uh, look out for that newsletter on bloomgold.com. Mike Goolsby is always with us on either Sunday live or sometimes maybe a little bit later in the week as well. Uh, Mike, thank you again, man. Your shows are awesome. Your input is awesome. Uh, and we'll do it all again next week. How's that sound? Sounds good to me, Greg. I'll all right, guys. Here. We'll see you all later.